Hello, and welcome to uh, this Facebook Live for Defeat Diabetes, and welcome to my colleague, Dr. Paul Mason in Sydney. How are you, Paul? I'm very well, thank you, Peter. Always great to be here. Good, good. Now, look, we've got uh, a lot of interest in, uh, in this. As soon as you mention the word cholesterol, everybody gets, uh, gets interested. And I guess that's because we've been bombarded for about 50 years about cholesterol. But let's, let's start by, but just tell us what is cholesterol and, and why is it so important? Well, I mean, look, contrary to it, it's been vilified and demonised in the media for as long as I can remember. But essentially, it's a molecule, it's what we call a sterile molecule, and it is absolutely essential for life. In actual fact, it's so important that every cell in the body actually makes it. And basically, without cholesterol, we would die. But that's not where the conversation ends, because we use the term cholesterol to refer to these uh, other markers we often assess on our blood tests. And a lot of people would be confused for thinking that when we talk about LDL and HDL on a blood test, we use the terms good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, you'd be confused for thinking it was actually cholesterol, but they're actually different things. Right. So look, uh, let's just, we're established. Okay, cholesterol is important. Uh, it's essential for life. Um, but there's concerns about, uh, about abnormal amounts of it. And the way people measure that is, as you say, you go to your doctor, you have a blood test, and you get these very sort of confusing lot of, uh, of uh, results. You, you have a total cholesterol, you have LDL, HDL, triglycerides. T t take us through those and tell us what they all mean. All right. Well, basically, if you've ever uh, seen oil in water, you can sort of see how the oil will sort of concentrate together. It doesn't disperse throughout the water evenly. So if we need to carry fat around in our blood, and we do need to, then we need something to help that oil disperse. It's almost like a detergent. So we have these little carrier particles, which we we'll call lipoproteins. And they're like little submarines that'll go swimming through our blood and carrying their cargo of fat. And some of the fat that they'll carry is actually cholesterol. So cholesterol will be inside these lipoprotein submarines, if you will. And there's different types of these lipoproteins. So some of them are called the two most common ones that we know about, a low-density lipoprotein, which we abbreviate LDL, and that's got the pejorative, and dare I say, incorrect moniker of bad cholesterol. And then we've got HDL, which is often referred to as good cholesterol. In actual fact, they're both essential for life, and in my opinion, they're both good. Now, quite aside from this, there's another fat in the blood, which is just as important, and that's called triglycerides. Now, a triglyceride is a tri, meaning three glyceride. It actually basically has a backbone structure and three fatty acids attaching to it. And believe it or not, the level of triglycerides in your blood is just as predictive, if not more predictive, at your risk of heart disease than the HDL and LDL levels. Right. Well, uh, we'll come back to triglyceride in a minute. But um, tell us about, you know, what do these tests mean for you? And let's say, you know, oh, my doctor says uh, I've got my total cholesterol is too high and my LDL is too high. What, uh, what does that mean? Well, basically, you know, when you go and get a blood test from a doctor, and you've got what we call the reference intervals, which are these numbers down the sides. They're sort of like the flag posts that will identify the upper and lower level of a blood test which you should actually aim for. So when your doctor says your cholesterol is too high, effectively what they're saying is that that particular number is outside the reference interval or the flagpoles. The problem is those flagpoles are not set based on science. They're, for whatever, you know, however they're set, it, it's not objective data that will actually relate to your risk of adverse health outcome or cardiovascular disease. So we know that high levels of cholesterol, ironically, paradoxically, are actually associated with increased longevity with a longer lifespan. So if we take LDL cholesterol, for instance, We've got very, very good prospective data, which means it's data that happens, you know, we, we actually assess a population based on their 
cholesterol level, and then we follow them up for a number of years to see how long they'll live. And we've got very good prospective data that people with higher LDL levels, on average, live significantly longer than people with low LDL levels. And remember, LDL is what is often pejoratively called bad cholesterol. We also see that people with high HDL levels will tend to live longer. And we see the opposite is true for triglycerides. So if I can just bring the third picture back into the puzzle here, the triglycerides, we see that people with high triglyceride levels actually live shorter. Right, now hang on a minute. The audience is probably confused because they've been told for years and years that high cholesterol and in particular high LDL cholesterol is bad news and that we should be taking measures such as taking statins to reduce those. Now you're saying that they're not a concern. So tell us a little bit about how we got to this point where we thought that cholesterol and LDL cholesterol was the worst possible things that could happen to us. Well, basically, we have the wall pulled over our eyes as doctors, as scientists, as medical professionals, and even the public. So what I'd like to do is this article here. I don't know. You should be able to see that now. So basically, this was published in the British Medical Journal. And this is what we call a systematic review. The big problem with research, as you know, Peter, is that people have a tendency to cherry pick what little bit of research they want from here, from there, from there, what have you, that little bit of science that will support their particular point of view. Now, a systematic review uh, attempts to eliminate these kind of biases and it says, let's look at the research in its entirety. We'll encompass it all together and we'll see what the average result is. So if we have an outlying bit of research here or outlying bit of research there, it will be averaged out, if you will, and we'll get a, a truer representation of what the science actually is. So this was a systematic review. It was published in British Medical Journal, one of the world's most prestigious medical journals. And it was actually a systematic review looking at people's average level of LDL cholesterols and their longevity, how long they lived. And what they actually found, they, did a, they found studies with over 68,000 patients. And what they reliably showed was that people with the lowest LDL level would die far more early than people with the highest LDL level. So first of all, we need to establish the fact that it's absolutely fact, it's proven scientific fact that on average, higher LDL levels are associated with longevity. So then the question is, well, how on God's green earth did we end up in this situation? And it started with a Russian scientist called Nikolai Anakov, who actually fed rabbits fat and cholesterol so you'll know that rabbits they tend to eat grass they're what we call herbivores their digestive anatomy is not designed to digest saturated fat and cholesterol but he found that when he fed these rabbits food for which their digestive anatomy was not suited for that they developed atherosclerosis basically heart disease and in the over the longer term it was actually found that these uh Pardon me, sorry, we just got a bit of noise in the background there. Excuse me. Fiona. So it was assumed that because when you feed with saturated fat, your cholesterol level will increase, that this was actually the direct uh, and proximal cause of heart disease. And quite obviously, it's quite ludicrous to make this extent extension from rabbits to humans and yet that's actually what they did so a bloke called Ansel Keys came in and picked up the ball and he uh, he pushed the burrow on what was then called the lipid heart hypothesis the notion being that well if uh, high cholesterol is associated with heart disease in rabbits we know that eating saturated fat increases your cholesterol level it all then became into this logical extension that saturated fat must be also bad for you and by extension um, our dietary food pyramid came to reflect that. And much in the same way that the research that clearly shows LDL is actually not bad for us, the overwhelming abundance of literature shows that saturated fats indeed are not bad for us. But this has actually led to a massive problem because it's then led us down two rabbit holes. One, it's a, a fear of saturated fat, and two, this attraction for drugs which would somehow lower the levels of these lipoproteins and cholesterol in our blood 
both of them strongly erroneous. Right, so you're basically suggesting that the cholesterol and LDL are uh, not that important or high levels of, uh, of that are not that important. So let's talk about triglycerides and, and HDL because they're probably uh, the two more important measures, um, but they tend to be ignored. Now, if you're acidic, you'd say that's because there are no drugs to treat it, but uh, I wouldn't say anything like that, of course. But um, tell us about uh, the importance of triglycerides and HDL, and in particular the ratio between the two. Well, when we said that, you'll note that I was very careful before when I commented on the risk of LDL and I said that on average, high LDL levels are associated with mortality, uh, longer lifespan. And the reason I said that is because not all LDL is good. We can actually have LDL that is damaged and it doesn't do the normal job of what it's meant to do when it's circulating around in our bloodstream. And this is called small dense LDL. And this is where the story of triglycerides and HDL becomes more relevant because we can either directly measure how much small dense LDL there is with a fancy blood test called a lipid subfraction or lipid electrophoresis, or we can estimate it by using a ratio of triglycerides to HDL. It just so happens that if you've got more of this bad small dense LDL, then you're more likely to have higher triglyceride levels and lower HDL levels. And if we simply look at the ratio between the two, uh, that will be very, very predictive of both small dense LDL and more usefully of adverse cardiovascular outcome. So on a standard blood test, if you're actually worried about your risk of falling off your perch from a heart attack or having a stroke, then on a standard what we call cholesterol panel or lipid panel, the two most important blood tests to look at are your triglycerides and your HDL. And my goal is to aim for a triglycerides that's less than 0.8 and a HDL that's at least 1.5. Now, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty good results. You'd be very happy with, uh, with those. Um, what, what about uh, the ratio? It's interesting, in, in those lipid panels, they have a, a bunch of ratios they often put at the bottom. Uh, none of which are, is actually the, uh, the the only one that's really relevant, which is the triglyceride HDL ratio. So you actually have to work that out yourself. You have to uh, put your triglyceride, which might be one, over your, your HDL, which might be 1.5, and, and you get your uh, your ratio. Do you have a figure that you'd like to sort of your triglyceride HDL ratio to be to be under? There, there's some people say it should be less than two. Some people say it should be less than 1.5. You've suggested from those figures you mentioned that it should be even less than one. But uh, where yeah. where do you stand on that? Well, look, I we see the best results when it's uh, less than 0 0.8 and ideally less than 0 0.5. So uh, right. that's pretty unusual. I mean, you know, I think most people. Uh, Pardon me for one second. Sorry, Peter. Most people say that uh, an HDL, a triglyceride HDL ratio of less than 1.5 is to be aimed at. So uh, we like our triglycerides to be around about that, less than 1.5, and our HDL to be certainly over one and ideally 1.5. But uh, um, I think if it's, you know, if your triglyceride, HDL ratio is over 1.5, especially if it's over 2, you certainly need to be doing something about it and you're definitely at higher risk then of, uh, of a cardiovascular and, uh, and, and premature death with that, uh, that sort of ratio. I think, uh, you know, you'd be concerned, wouldn't you, Paul, if you had a patient with a, a triglyceride HDL ratio of, say, 2.5 or something like that, that would be a significant concern to you. Oh, absolutely. And with you know, in that kind of patient, we're likely to see metabolic disease, insulin resistance, poor blood sugar levels, fatty liver disease. You, at that level, you're going to see a whole constellation of metabolic disease. So what do you say, Paul, to, to the, the, the patient who comes into you and, and, you know, they might have a slightly elevated total cholesterol and a slightly elevated LDL, and they say, uh, my doctor wants to put me on statins to get my cholesterol down. And, um, you know, what can I say to my doctor? Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of nuance to the question about statins. And, I mean, let's uh, first of all appreciate that uh, we're talking on the Defeat Diabetes uh, channel here, Peter. So many of our people in the audience will actually have diabetes. 
And we know that diabetes itself is a massive cardiovascular risk factor. That elevated blood glucose and elevated insulin that comes in concert with that is very damaging to the blood vessels around the heart and around the rest of the body. So we know that taking statins is actually an independent risk factor for diabetes, for developing diabetes itself. So we've got the Women's Health Initiative Study, which is an extremely large randomised controlled trial that actually was looking at diet. And one element of that, they did an analysis on females who were also taking statins. And it's estimated that the risk of developing diabetes could be increased by up to 71% by taking a statin. Now, if you've also got a bit of time and you go on to chrisdor.com and have a look at the prescriber information on that website, which they have to have there by law, you'll actually see that there's an acknowledgement that Crestor and indeed all statins increase the diabetes to the point it actually um, can cause diabetes when there would not have been. It increases average blood sugar levels. It increases HbA1c, fasting blood glucose levels. Uh, so we've got multiple lines of evidence that show that in terms of diabetic control, uh, it is impaired when taking statins. And if you appreciate that poorly controlled diabetes is a major, major cardiovascular risk factor, then we have to ask the question, well, is taking statins uh, necessarily a good thing? We've got another line of evidence, which is very interesting, and it's about talking about the magnitude of benefit that people could possibly expect for taking statins too. Now, this is irrespective of if you're diabetic or not. Um, if we just have a look at the uh, average survival propagate prolongation with statins. Now, just because you're taking statin doesn't stop you from dying from a heart attack. At best, it will delay your dying because you're still going to die. So there was a very clever systematic review that was done a few years back, again, published in British Medical Journal, and that analysed exactly how long for people taking statins would prolong their life using the best available data. Understanding that the participant level data is considered a trade secret so that independent investigators aren't allowed to access that. And that is absolutely true. So the data that we have been entrusted with that independent investigators are allowed to access actually demonstrates that taking statins will only prolong the life between about three and four days. So days. days. So that, that's not a misspeak. So the magnitude of benefit also needs to be taken into account. Now, a lot of people's doctors will say, well, it's going to stop you from dying. And the question is, well, what makes me different to any of these other participants in the study who, you know, only stood to benefit from days? And in actual fact, there have been some studies that show adverse effect and deterioration of uh, longevity uh, when taking statins. Now, just one more point, if, uh, if you could humour me. A few years ago, I got an email from a doctor and she was being pressured to prescribe. This is in America and her prescribing habits were being reviewed and she got told that she wasn't giving enough statins to her patients, her diabetic patients. And there was this piece of research here that was held up as a, uh, a reason for why she should be prescribing it because... This is an expert review paper um, written by the American Diabetes Association that clearly recommends the use of statins in all diabetes. And what they actually say is within the article, clearly they say there's an improvement in mortality. People live longer when they take statins and they cited six references to support this claim. So I thought, well, that's interesting because that sort of clashes with my understanding of the literature. So I went and read each of those six references. Now, of those six references saying that people would live longer, three of them didn't even measure lifespan. And I think you'll appreciate it's a bit hard to make a claim about something you don't measure. The other three studies that were listed actually did measure lifespan. They just didn't find any benefit for taking of statins. So in actual fact, it was complete and utter fabrication. And I think it's important for people to know that even very well-educated, caring, conscientious doctors 
can be misled. You can read an article like this and take it at face value, which is what most of us will do. And unless you've got the time and the urge to really go down into the nitty gritty, um, you'll have the wool pulled over your eyes. So the question about whether to take statins or not, it's one that obviously we can't provide you today. Uh, Peter and I can't provide it uh, to any individual who's not our patient, but it's worth having a conversation with your doctor. You can ask about the research that showed that there was only an extension of a few days of mortality. Ask about where's the evidence that this is going to benefit me. And if you are a diabetic and you understand that statins have been shown to worsen blood sugar control, it's reasonable to ask your doctor, well, is there any potential or putative benefit of taking the statin? Is that going to more than offset the deleterious effect of what it's going to do to my blood sugar level? There's also the issue of all the different side effects of, uh, of statins. You've mentioned the, uh, the diabetes link with, uh, with taking statins. What about some of the other side effects? Because uh, a significant number of people, probably more than 20, uh, 20 25% of people, uh, can't well, stop taking their statins after a fairly short period of time because of side effects. Oh, absolutely. And the side effects is uh, underdone. So there's multiple ways that drug companies can distort the literature on statins. So one of their favourite ways is to have what we call a run-in period. So I was just reading a study the other day on statins, and what they did is that they gave, before the trial started, they gave everybody a statin. And 11,000 of them approximately had significant side effects, so they were withdrawn from the study before it even started. Now, do you think the side effect data was based on these 11,000 people who withdraw with side effects, or do you think it was based on the population that was remaining who had then proven that they were tolerant to statins? So this is abuse of a run-in period. And there's multiple other ways that we can actually get to the truth of it. But in reality, as you say, Peter, it's at least one in four people have significant side effects from statins. And there's no wonder why. You asked at the start, what is cholesterol? And I basically said, it's a molecule without which we die. But there's a lot more detail to it. So it's the precursor to all of our sex hormones, our testosterone, our estrogen. If you don't have enough test, uh, cholesterol, as a male, you can't make testosterone. It, it's, there's multiple. If you want to make vitamin D, vitamin D's, you know, it's been in the news a lot recently. It's something very desirable. If you don't have enough cholesterol, you can't make vitamin D. There's multiple factors in the body for which cholesterol is an absolutely essential ingredient. So if we have a look at some of these other things in terms of brain function, We've actually got some very nice studies now. There's one of my favourites. It's actually they had people who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, which is a terrible condition, as you know. Um, these, the ones who were taking the statins, they got them to stop taking their statins and their Alzheimer's disease apparently disappeared. They resumed their statins and their symptoms came back. There can be no doubt that there's a subset of the population who has statin-related cognitive decline, which in some cases is actually misdiagnosed as dementia. Uh, we know that it leads to, you know, low testosterone levels. We know that it can increase the risk of diabetes. Um, the, the list of side effects is long. If we go back to the very original research on statins, now this is absolutely fascinating and probably digging in the weeds a little bit. There was a, the gentleman who invented statins was a Japanese scientist by the name of Akira Endo. He worked for the Japanese pharmaceutical firm called Sankayo. And Sankayo, back in the 80s, they were, or the late 70s, they were in a race with Merck um, to bring the first statin to market because they had this belief that cholesterol was bad and if they could bring it down, then basically there would be a financial gold mine waiting for whoever did it. Now, Sankayo in 1980, they pulled out of the race to develop statins because about 50% of their test animals, which were dogs, were developing cancer. Now, it's very hard to come by this research in terms of humans because the, the studies, they really don't uh, assess it and specifically look for it. But it's certainly telling that Sankayo pulled out of the research for the very first statin, which eventually was brought to market. Um, by Merck, by the way, and is still uh, available in America today. Um, and they they pulled out of that because it was causing too many cancers. 
Right. Well, look, if we can summarise this part of it anyway, that we, what we're saying is that um, your total cholesterol and LDL scores are probably not that, uh, having high levels are probably not that, uh, that dangerous, that the important uh, measure is, uh, is your triglyceride HDL ratio, which you get by dividing your triglyceride, let's say two by your um, HDL, let's say 1.5. So you get the ratio of that. And that uh, statin, the use of statins is probably in, in most cases not indicated. But what if you uh, someone comes to you, Paul, and, and says that uh, look, you know, my I've got a high cholesterol, a high LDL, and look, you know, I've, I believe what you're saying, but I'm still really worried about uh, about heart disease and so on. Is there anything that you can uh, offer them that will give them some reassurance about uh, about the state of their of their heart and their coronary arteries? Well, look, I'm a fan, and I know you're a fan too, of something called the coronary artery calcium score. Now, what this is, this is a CT scan of the heart, basically. It looks at the blood vessels around the outside of the heart, and it looks for calcium deposits within those blood vessels. And we know that sudden blockages of the vessels in the heart are very, very unlikely to occur when there is no calcium. So when we do a calcium score, we basically get a score from zero and it doesn't have an absolute upper limit, but generally about a thousand. I have seen a few higher than that, but generally between zero and a thousand ish. And if it's zero, then this has been described in the literature as being like a warranty on your heart. It basically it says the chance of having an adverse cardiovascular event in the near future is very low. Alternatively, I've seen a lot of people who have low cholesterol levels, but they have a very, very high coronary artery calcium score. And we know that the calcium score is far more predictive than, than the blood levels of cholesterol could ever be. So I think for a more accurate assessment, I really do like to integrate the coronary artery calcium score and also understand it's not the absolute level of LDL that matters, but as you said, these other risk factors, what's the triglyceride doing? What's the HDL doing? And we can also have a look at blood sugar as well. What's the HbA1c, which is a measure of average blood sugar? What's your fasting glucose? What's your fasting insulin? What about the other inflammatory markers? They're very important for predicting cardiovascular risk, CRP and ESR. So I like to take a, a big contextual approach where we look at everything uh, and try and integrate the findings together. And I try not to look at any one finding purely in isolation. Okay, so can patients uh, ask the request uh, a calcium, a CT calcium score from their from their doctor? Absolutely, they can. So there is a little bit of a nuance to it because uh, through Medicare, if you have a coronary artery calcium score combined with something called an angiogram, where you actually have dye injected into your vessels, and that can be covered under Medicare. Uh, but I believe it is quite expensive. It's usually about $700. Now, you can always have a coronary artery calcium score done by itself, which removes that invasive element of having something injected into your veins. And that's usually, depending on where you go, between about $50 and $150 if you pay for it privately. But, of course, you do require your doctor to uh, refer you for that. And my understanding is that some doctors will be far happier to do that than others. And I think that just relates to people's exposure to it and how comfortable they are interpreting the results and, uh, and making recommendations based on what those results are. Yeah, I've never really understood why there's been this reluctance to do such a good uh, a good test as uh, as this. I mean, doctors order so many tests all the time. I mean, partly okay, maybe it's not rebatable by Medicare, which it should be, and hopefully it will be one day. But uh, as you said, it's not particularly expensive. Um, you know, to pay uh, you know one hundred and fifty dollars for for something that uh, you know could give you a huge amount of reassurance, particularly if you have some abnormal blood tests. I think is uh, you know. Is relatively cheap for the reassurance that you're going to get from uh, from something like that, but I've I've never really understood why uh, doctors are, are so reluctant to uh, to order that that test. It seems to be such a good test. It's such a good predictor of uh, of cardiovascular disease. It's not invasive, um, and uh, you know you don't uh, there are no side effects from it. It's a very simple test. It's not ridiculously expensive. Uh, and yet, you know, many doctors are, are reluctant. I think there's been a little bit of recent publicity, you know, because obviously we've had some very high profile heart attacks of late. 
and and I was really pleased to see in the in the media some of the uh, the Heart Foundation and others uh, promoting this uh, this coronary calcium score because it's the first time I've ever really heard it uh, and mentioned it in the public and, uh, and I think both you and I find it incredibly valuable to uh, to use on our uh, on our patients so uh, yeah I think that's a that's a good thing if we can uh, if we can get some more more of that uh, more of that happening. So I would tend to agree. I think I think it's familiarity, number one. So if doctors aren't familiar with something, if, if they haven't gone out of their way to educate themselves about it, it's certainly not a part of mainstream education yet. So I think that's part of the problem. And your point about reassurance is hugely valuable because we see all the time people with these so-called high LDL levels. Number one, they usually have superb triglyceride to HDL ratios. And then to boot, if we find that they've got a very, very low coronary artery calcium score, well, they can be very, very reassured that in absolute terms, their risk of cardiovascular disease is very low. Okay, so if we're not going to... Uh... If we're not going to use uh, statins to lower our our cholesterol, uh, because uh, a we don't think uh, you know statins do a fantastic job of it, and probably it's not that important anyway. Um, what uh, what about the role of diet? Um, obviously, you know we're we're all about uh, diet on this uh, on this program, um, and the effect of uh, let's say a, a a low carb diet, the sort of low carb diet that defeat diabetes uh, promotes, and that we uh, that we promote on on the app. Um, what about the effect of a diet like this, which is high in uh, in or higher in saturated fat than the traditional sort of a uh, diet? Mm -hmm. What about the effect of uh, of that on your cholesterol and LDL and so on? Because some people um, are concerned that that's you know that's one of the reasons not to go on a you know to on a diet high in saturated fat because of the concern about cholesterol. What uh, what do you tell your patients who uh, are concerned about that? Well, I think we really should be worried about actual outcomes. And, and by that I mean what has been proven to make you live longer. So when it comes down to what's been proven to make people live longer, then we know that saturated fat in the diet is probably in that regard because when we've done research that looks at compares saturated fat which may increase your cholesterol levels versus seed oil and vegetable oils which will probably bring it down we've actually got very very clear evidence that the saturated fat um, diets prove superior so uh, i'm in sydney so we've got a study called the sydney diet heart study which was absolutely fascinating so this was performed in the late 60s and the early 1970s and that took a group of men who'd had heart attacks and it randomised them to either have their normal diet, which was relatively high in saturated fat, or to have diets which were much higher in vegetable and seed oils, these polyunsaturated fats. And what they actually found was that, yes, if you took the seed oils and the vegetable oils, your cholesterol level would go down. Now, that's quite predictable. But concerningly, the chance of dying increased by 62%. So the question is, do we worry about what we call surrogate markers, which are, are things like cholesterol that may or may not be relevant, or do we worry about heart outcomes that we really care about? So heart outcome would be something like having a heart attack, having a stroke, or indeed dying. And I would argue that we should always look at heart outcomes in research rather than surrogate markers. And indeed, when we do look at the research on heart outcomes in terms of diet, then we really do get a lot of comfort with regards to saturated fat intake. So if I can bring this back to diabetics, because we know that diabetes in and of itself is a huge risk factor for early mortality for, you know, uh, we call dementia now type 3 diabetes because uh, it's a, uh, you know, diabetes is a massive risk factor for for dementia and diabetes, the brain is only 2% of the body's weight and it uses 20% of the body's energy. It's hugely metabolically active. Anything that's going to mess your metabolism is going to mess your brain. So in terms of uh, understanding these considerations, there's two factors, two dietary factors that really come to the fore. And people who have seen the masterclass videos through the Defeat Diabetes Program will be well aware of the two main facets that we focus on is removing sugars and carbohydrates which will lead to unstable blood glucose levels in diabetics 
and also removing the seed oils and the vegetable oils, which are very oxidised, and they're basically a necessary component of most highly processed foods. And one of your favourite sayings, Peter, is just eat real food. It's, uh, you know, food, something that your grandmother would recognise as food, something that doesn't come in a cardboard box and doesn't last for a shelf for five years. Um, they're clearly, you know, industrially produced um, items that have no relevance to modern nutrition or they should have no relevance to modern nutrition. So the two key factors I would say is um, remove the sugars per se from the diet, so fructose-containing sugars, uh, things like uh, sucrose and um, things like this stuff that you'll see in a, a soft drink or table sugar, what have you, and then remove the seed oils. And for most people just making those simple, simple changes, it will lead to a significant change in eating habits and in most cases leads to a significant improvement in health outcomes. So while we're on the topic of, uh, of seed oils or vegetable oils, as they're erroneously uh, called, there, there you're right, they are seed oils. And we're talking about things like canola oil, safflower oil, corn oil, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the things that the uh, the makers of uh, of that say that it's you know it's, it lowers your cholesterol. So these are what we call polyunsaturated uh, fats that uh, that lower the omega six ones that uh, lower your cholesterol, and so they're promoted as being healthy, and yet you're saying that you know, that they're in fact not healthy. Now, uh, can you explain a little bit more about why they're considered by some people to be healthy? Well, I guess the, the lipid heart hypothesis explains this. So it comes back to Nikolay Anikov and his rabbits, which were force-fed, and they developed heart disease. So if you assume that, that what happens in rabbits applies to humans, then you also say, well, if we feed human saturated fat and they have higher cholesterol levels from that, then that too must be bad for humans. So that's where the erroneous assumption that seed oils must be good uh, rises because seed oils they actually have a constituent called sterols which is like cholesterol but it, it's a plant form of cholesterol so it's not the same so our bodies knowing how important cholesterol is will absorb this chemical from plants but it can't use it to produce cholesterol in the same way so in effect it tricks our body and it leads to a lowering of our cholesterol levels now i would argue that tricking the body physiologically like that is not a good thing to do. Our, our bodies are finely tuned machines and they know what they're doing. They devote a lot of resources to making cholesterol for a good reason. Our body does not, it's not an inefficient machine. Our body is incredibly well refined. If, if it's going to do something, it's going to do it for a purpose. So by taking these seed oils, which will artificially lower our cholesterol, basically by giving our body something, it's doing the bait and switch. It's our body thinks we're getting cholesterol and it's like, ha you've got a sterile, you can't do anything with this. Um, yes, our cholesterol lowers, but that's not beneficial. And, you know, the, the literature clearly demonstrates this. I mentioned the Sydney Diet Heart Study before. I could have mentioned the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. This was a study on thousands of females and males uh, in America who were randomised, it was a double-blinded randomised control trial, very well done. And again, that showed that when you give people vegetable oil, yes, or seed oils, as they're because they don't come from vegetables, that's a marketing myth. Um, when you give people seed oils, uh, yes, their cholesterols do lower. Again, unfortunately, their risk of dying increased. And we, we can belabour the point all day, but the simple fact is the population at large has been misled and we are probably going to need to repeat this message multiple times for people to actually understand it, to realise that they have been misled. From the time that they first saw that food pyramid, they had the wool pulled over their eyes. Well, you know, the wool was pulled over the eyes of people from both those studies you mentioned, the Sydney Diet Heart Study and the Minnesota Coronary Study, because the initial results of both of those uh, came out as if they were, uh, you know, favouring the use of, uh, of polyunsaturated fats until someone actually uh, looked at the data independently and found that uh, the opposite was the case. So you could argue that it was quite fraudulent. 
Well, this is a really important story because I've just presented this data because it's now in the public domain that was published in British Medical Journal. Um, but the fact is when the studies were completed, this data was unpalatable to the investigators and so it was hidden. Now, and it's quite literally, this uh, one researcher, Dr Chris Ramsden, actually discovered the study data for both these studies hidden in basements after the passing of the original researchers and managed to validate it, verify it and decode it and get it up to a level where it was uh, able to be published in the prestigious British Medical Journal, and which was an amazing event. But the fact is, when the studies were concluded in 1973, and the data was not published until 2013 and 2016, respectively. So the question is, if we had in that ensuing 40 or so odd years, if that data had been published 40 years prior, when it should have been published, we probably wouldn't be in this situation today where people have been able to double down on these myths and allow their cognitive biases and confirmation bias to reinforce this misguided belief. And this is, you know, you, you talk about academic misconduct, and I think that's absolutely correct. Now, one of the lead investigators, he was interviewed before his death, and he was asked about why the study results accurately weren't published um, at the time. And he said, well, we, we basically just didn't like the results. And you cannot do that. As a scientist, your duty is to test a hypothesis. If your study finds against your hypothesis, you disregard that hypothesis and start again. You don't cling to it and bed down and find weasel words that try and make it work. And unfortunately, this has been done time and time again, and we're still seeing it ongoing now with the famous Women's Health Initiative. Mm. Particularly when these studies are, you know, sometimes funded by the uh, the very drug companies that are trying to uh, promote their drugs. But look, we we uh, we could talk for hours about all this, but a, we've got a whole bunch of questions here, Paul. So I might quickly run through uh, some questions and comments. Okay, so first one from Peter: I've lost over forty kg in the last twelve months. But because my LDL is high, my doc wants me on a statin, which I've refused. The only way he'll accept it is if I get a coronary calcium score. So, uh, you know, again, I think that's a really good way of, uh, of reassuring both your doctor and yourself that, uh, that you know, your high cholesterol is probably not that, that, that important. Well, let's just um, talk now about that for a second, Peter, because there can sure. be a, a, a complexity that arises now. So if you remember, so the way I look at it, very simplistically, you know I'm a simple guy, is that your blood tests show you what's happening now. But the coronary artery calcium score shows you history. It shows you what's happened in the past. And it's quite possible that you may have had a, a lifetime of uh, good living and then you have gone and gotten yourself healthy and lost 40 kilograms, which, by the way, is a fantastic effort. But now your triglycerides and HDL may look good, but your calcium score is still reflective of your history. So it is still very possible that you will have a high calcium score. Now, it is an absolute fact that if we understand that calcium score isn't a risk factor for heart disease, it's also a known fact that statins increase the rate of calcium accumulation in your coronary vessels. So... It's very interesting because with the cognitive biases of the researchers, researchers know very, very well that calcium in blood vessels is bad. They also know very well that statins increase calcification. So how do you reconcile this together? So they use the term paradoxical calcification. Paradoxical because they assume that statins are great. So an increase in calcification, there must be something about the calcification from that's induced by statins that is beneficial, whereas calcification from any other cause is bad. And you can't make this up. If you Google statins and calcification, you'll come up after line after line of studies talking about this paradoxical calcification. And I, for one, just can't get my head around it. How do, they, do these people even hear themselves? But the problem is, um, going back to uh, the gentleman who's lost 40 kilograms, you might get a coronary artery calcium score and understand it may be elevated because of the damage you've done in the past. And in that case, it's also useful to, at least in the medium term, to have a look at consecutive calcium scores 
perhaps done every two or three years because the rate of calcium increase, while the absolute level of calcification is an important indicator of risk, I believe it's that's the biggest risk factor if you don't change your lifestyle. I think once you've changed your lifestyle, I think then the next best metric is having a look at the rate of change. So on average, you know, you, you really, ideally, you want to have less than 5% incrementation in your calcium score every year. The, the truth is it should be zero. And I've seen a lot of patients with very high calcium scores who over substantial periods of time have been able to completely stop any further progression. So if you do with, find... With changing their diet. Through yeah. changing their diet. If you have done... Because remember, statins have actually been proven to increase coronary artery calcification. So if you're really concerned about the calcification um, and you're going to be using that as a metric, then understand that's going to be compromised if you're taking a statin. It's going to make it very difficult to put a break on it. Okay, some more questions or comments. Health professionals say that high cholesterol has a lead to increased risk of macular degeneration. Can you comment on that? Sorry, health professionals say that high cholesterol... High cholesterol like... has a link to increased risk of macular degeneration. Have you heard that one? Uh, absolutely. So if we actually have a... that, That's not true, first of all. So what causes macular degeneration is oxidative stress. And it's very well known that supplementing with vitamin A, lutein and uh, some other compounds is actually beneficial for macular degeneration. And the reason is because these are potent antioxidants. Um, we've got some genetic conditions that can actually lead to early retinal uh, damage in the eyes. And I was actually just happened to be looking at the literature on that last week. Um, because that was a model for um, early macular degeneration. And there's some very impressive research that shows that compounds which we know to be have antioxidant capacity like coenzyme Q10 and melatonin um, have been proven to have benefit with regards to delaying retinal damage and, you know, macular damage. So in terms of early macular degeneration, it's actually oxidative stress. You, you, you know, and we speak to our joint friend, uh, James Mukey, Australian of the Year, a couple of years back, he knows that oxidative stress, high blood sugar levels, fluctuating blood sugar levels, these are the major causes of blindness. So get your sugars under control. Get your oxidation under control. Make sure you don't have fatty liver anymore. So speaking of oxidation, I've got a question here. Liposcan and oxidated LDL blood tests, does that help to show the good LDL and the bad LDL? To a degree, yes. Um, they're not completely mutually exclusive. So small dense LDL tends to be damaged by a process of sugar attachment, glycation, and oxidation. So we call it glycooxidation. So there is an element of oxidation in causing uh, small dense LDL. Now, there are some antibody studies where we can actually assess uh, for oxidized LDL particles but it has to be said they're not perfectly accurate. And they can give an indication, but I don't think they offer anything more clinically over what an LDL subfraction would do. Um, we've got a few comments here about people who've had calcium tests uh, and how much they cost. One cost $150, uh, one cost $200. So, uh, yeah, there's a broad range of uh, some of them, as you say, as low as $70 or I've seen $120 or whatever. So different amounts uh, about for your calcium uh, score. Okay, um, someone's asking about homocysteine, which is a, uh, a blood marker that some people say is important. Tell us about homocysteine, Paul. Well, homocysteine is very complex. It's, uh, it's very important. Now, we haven't talked about this at all yet, Peter, but we're, the atherosclerosis or the, the plumbing model of heart disease assumes that you have this buildup of fat inside the blood vessel and it slowly narrows and that's what kills people. And in actual fact, it's not. These sudden slow, what we call stenoses or blockages, don't kill people. What will happen is they'll build another blood vessel. It's called angiogenesis. They'll get what we call a collateral circulation, which is detours, and they'll form new blood vessels to bypass the blockage. What kills people is sudden blockages, and that usually happens from blood clotting. And... Homocysteine is actually a significant risk factor that is associated with the risk of clotting. 
So that's uh, if you actually look at the data on elevated homocysteine levels and chance of dying, we see that you really don't want to have a homocysteine over nine if you're striving for optimal health. And if you have a look at the reference ranges, they'll usually accept up to 12 to 15 as being acceptable, which is completely erroneous. Now, when we do see an elevated homocysteine, there's a few common causes that are cited in the literature. So B group vitamin deficiency, particularly B6 and B12 are commonly cited, folate deficiency, and less appreciated is problems with the thyroid and problems with the kidneys. So when you see an elevated homocysteine, it's very difficult in isolation to determine the root cause of it because I've just listed five possible causes for it to be elevated. So you really need to contextualise it and go back and have a look at the rest of the results and the rest of the history and the rest of the examination and see do you have any evidence of nutrient malabsorption? Do you have any evidence of a deficient diet? Do you have any evidence of thyroid issues or kidney issues? So it's far from a simple... Uh, resolution to determine exactly what's going on but the fact remains it is an incredibly significant cardiovascular risk factor and it is strongly associated with increased risk of blood clotting and remember heart attacks are basically suddenly forming clots within the blood vessels of the heart right thank you for that um we've also should tell people that uh, we're giving an exclusive giveaway to everyone who's uh, who's attending we're giving a, uh, a free copy of our Healthy and Hearty e-cookbook. You can see there on the bottom of the screen where you can uh, download it, the, the link to, uh, to that. So if you uh, copy that link into your, into your browser, you'll uh, probably do okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, let us know if you have problems doing that. But that should uh, go pretty well. And then you'll also go into the running to win a 30-minute private Q&A session with me. Ah, uh, well, you know, you had to put up with me for an hour. You know, you're going to have another 30 minutes. Just Where do I one. sign up? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, second prize is 45 minutes with me. But anyway, um, so let's get back to your questions because we're fast running out of time. Somebody wants to know about going off statins, whether you can just go, stop statins straight away or whether you have to sort of gradually go off them. So there is, as far as I know, and I've seen uh, many people who have voluntarily ceased their statins, there is no withdrawal side effects from stopping a statin. It's, they don't appear to be like other medications like antidepressants and so on and so forth, which can have significant withdrawal side effects. Okay. Of course, um, the point is yep. that this should always be done under medical guidance. Right. Um, now, someone wants to know about olive oil. So we mentioned uh, you know, seed oils and vegetable oils as being uh, deleterious to your health. What about olive oils? And I know you're, you're, you're not as much of a fan of olive oils as I am, but uh, I, I, I'm, I think olive oils are, are pretty good. But uh, you do have some concerns, don't you, Paul? Well, look, I, I consider olive oil a halfway house. And what I mean by that is it's much better than the seed oils. I mean, technically, it probably is the seed oil itself. But it's what we call oleic acid. 70% of olive oil is oleic acid, and that's what we call monounsaturated. And chemically, monounsaturated fats are not as bad for us as the polyunsaturated fats. So in that regard, if you're comparing it to a seed oil, um, a canola oil or a rice bran oil or something like that, then there's really no comparison. Then olive oil is going to be superior every time. But it's also true that when we compare olive oil to saturated fat, there is no compelling evidence that olive oil is superior in any way. And in my opinion, I believe that saturated fat's the best. Right. Okay. Um, just reminded by someone here that the link for, for the ebook is case sensitive. So use uppercase or lowercase. Those uh, two Ds have got to be uppercase. So you can uh, copy paste that uh, that link directly into your uh, browser and uh, away you go. Um, everyone's telling us how much they paid for their calcium test. So that's, you know, we've got an auction here. We've got $300 in Hobart. So uh, we're, uh, we're getting more and more as we, uh, as we go further south. Anyway. Um, profiteering it, um, <laughs> exactly is it worthwhile someone asked getting a lipid subfraction test if your doctor is insisting on statins although all your, your triglyceride is low i think we sort of covered that and we think that's probably yeah. a, you know no a, but there a, is a point here. Let, uh, this person who just 
pose that question is clearly feeling pressured to do something by their doctor. Now, mm. you're a doctor, you're a professor. Now, just tell me exactly what level of control and authority you exert over your patients. Well, yeah, I'd like to think a little bit, but, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I think it varies. Look, I think a lot of people, you know, feel very uncomfortable when they don't have their doctor's support for uh, something because we, you know, a lot of the population, we, we, you know, traditionally have respected the opinions of, uh, of doctors. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be quite uh, threatening to them when they, when they, get advice that they're uh, they don't you know necessarily agree with so i think you know they do want to uh to have their doctor on side if you like and they feel more comfortable if that's the case absolutely but uh, i guess I, I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek but just with the point that your doctor can't make you do anything the doctors i mean if we take doctor in latin it means teacher and for me personally i like to use uh the platform that being a doctor affords me to educate and to teach but i i try not to impose my will and at the end of the day what any patient does is based on their personal circumstances and their evaluation and basically it's up to them so i think it's fair for patients they shouldn't feel pressured to do something they don't want to do but they should expect that their doctor will give them all the available information so that they can make the decisions that's appropriate for them all right. Okay. Well, we're really uh, just about out of time. I think uh, there are a few more questions. I'm sorry we haven't got to, got to everyone, but uh, we'll do this again and uh, we'll have another uh, another chat. Uh, there are a lot of people who have come on and said uh, that they've uh, enjoyed the show and that they've also uh, got huge benefits from being on the uh, on the low carb defeat diabetes uh, diet. So thank you for all those people who've. Uh, have uh, sent that in and uh, given us some reassurance that we're uh, heading in the right direction. Um, so don't forget the exclusive giveaway. So uh, get your uh, e-cookbook, your healthy and hearty. And uh, if you're really unlucky, you might cop half an hour with me. But uh, it could be worse. You could have half an hour with Paul. Uh, so, Paul, thank you very much for your time. I know how busy you are. We really appreciate that. And uh, we'll be back with another uh, Defeat Diabetes Facebook Live in the near future. Thank you all for uh, for joining us. See you later.